If you brought your Bible, open it up to Revelation 21, 3, and this is where we are going to start. Revelation. Hello. It's just one verse. Relax. <laughs> Revelation 21, 3. This is where I believe the Lord wanted us to begin. It says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. My sermon title this morning is Pursuing His Presence. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your presence is already with us, that we don't have to perform to experience it, but that you are so generous with your presence. We thank you, Lord, that it was always your plan and in your heart that you would dwell with your people, that we would experience your goodness, that you would show us who you are. And Lord, I pray for every person in this room that our hunger would increase to experience your presence, that we would be people of your presence, God. Open our hearts, illuminate your word, eliminate distraction, help us to just focus in on these next few moments together with our church community, to learn from you, Lord, and to be changed. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I want you to hear today that God has always determined his presence to be within you and to be among us. And I firmly believe that in these days and in our culture, what is going to mark the people of God as distinct with a compelling testimony is that they have been in the presence of God. Simply put, you know the difference between someone who knows about God and someone who's been with him, right? And we often talk about the presence of God. Maybe you've been in like a Pentecostal environment before or charismatic or spirit-filled and you hear the presence of God and it feels a little like, woo, you know, what does it mean? And I think it's important for me to start by demystifying the presence of God just a little bit and to tell you that when I talk about the presence of God, this is what I'm talking about. I am talking about the person of God who is pleased to dwell with his people. God being with his people. It's when the person of God chooses to make his dwelling with us. It's when he makes himself felt. It's when he makes himself known. And when he allows us to experience the transformative power of being with him. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about the presence of God. And we get to know the character of God through his word. But how many of you know that he's alive? That he is not this ancient figure that we read about to get inspired by, but that he is alive and he is moving on the earth and he is speaking to us all the time. And there is fresh things he wants to see happen here on the earth. And scripture tells us that the eyes of God roam the earth looking for faithful ones. That he is looking for those who are seeking him. And that he wants to dwell with us and reveal his glory to us and his power to us. Can you believe that? This has me in awe, that the God of the universe, the God who made everything, the God who knows you intimately, who knows your mistakes, who knows your flaws, who knows your family history, that this God can be intimately known and wants to be with us. This is what he desires, and this is what I want to call our community into, is to a greater expectancy and hunger, that as we seek him, we find him, and that his presence is where breakthrough begins. And you need breakthrough, right? We all need breakthrough. There is at least one area in your life where you need it. And your striving won't bring it, and your inaction won't bring it either. Neither are working or will work for you. No, it's an encounter with the presence of the living God that's going to bring that breakthrough. And so I want to talk to us about four things that the presence of God brings to our lives and then what it looks like to increase our awareness of that presence and, and how it changes us. So first, his presence heals us. There's a story in Luke 8, and I want to read you a little snapshot, Luke 8, 43 through 48. It says, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. 
I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. And in the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And then he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. I want us to pay attention to a couple of things in this um, section of scripture because it's so powerful. First, no one could heal her. No one could heal her. Maybe she'd been looking for answers. We know that she'd been dealing with this pain, and not only this pain, but this shame for 12 years. And as a result, so much isolation, I'm sure such a diminished sense of self and self-identity, no one could heal her. And for some of us in this room, no one can heal you. Like, you've tried. You've sought out answers. You've dug. You can't figure it out. There's healing you're contending for, healing you hope for and believe for, you're losing hope for, and you don't know when it can come or how it can come, and nobody can heal you. And you relate to this experience. But in an instant, 12 years of shame and pain are gone. I want you to notice as well that Jesus notices specifically the people who seek him. That he was in a crowded room, but he knows the difference between those who are just rubbing shoulders with him and those who are reaching for him. And this is what will distinguish us. Are we just rubbing shoulders with Jesus? Are we just in the room? Are we just in the crowd? He knows the difference between those who are just moving around him and those who are reaching for him. So when he's saying, wait, something, someone touched me. His friends laugh at him like, yeah, it's crowded. There's a lot of people. There's probably, it could be anybody. But he notices something different about the person who is reaching. You can touch him with your desperation. You can reach him with your determination. He feels the difference. And in a crowded room today, would you know that Jesus sees you? He is impacted and experiences your reach for him. And when you think it doesn't matter, when you wonder if he knows your name, if you're consequential to the kingdom, when we can reduce this to just another thing we do, another extracurricular, a Sunday morning, or a weekend experience, you wonder if he sees you showing up with your family. You wonder if he still has something for you this morning, even though you got into a fight with your spouse on the way here. He was with you this week, and he sees all, and he knows all, and still he honors our reach. And that in a crowded room today, he sees you, and he stops, and he looks around, and he can tell the difference. Also notice she could not go unnoticed. I love that the passage says that. Seeing that she could not go unnoticed, she came trembling. You cannot go unnoticed. In church, we're good at this, though, right? We sneak in through the back. During the great break, we go get the coffee. Listen, I'm an introvert. I understand. That little forced friendship, you can't force me to do nothing. (laughs) Right? Like, that's my water break. It's easy to find a way to go unnoticed. And so many of us, we're one foot in, one foot out with this community thing, with this God thing. It's as long as it's comfortable But the desperation is what brought the healing. The desperation, the reach, the seeking, the putting herself out there. She had no business being in that crowd. She was an isolated member of society. She had no business being there. And she risked being there. She risked the vulnerability. She risked the transparency to reach him. And her faith brought her into the presence of Jesus, and that's what healed her. And some of us, we need to raise our faith for this season Like I mentioned before, I just have felt that there's a discouragement already that's been spoken over this year. And I just want to break that off of us this morning, that we need to raise our faith, that he is still on the throne, that he has good plans for you, that he notices you and sees you and has things for you that you don't even know how to ask for. Those dreams that are dormant, he knows, friend. Those gifts you feel on a shelf, he knows, friend. And it's important that we up our faith, not when we feel it and not when we see it, because faith is the evidence of things unseen. 
It is the belief that he's at work when we don't feel it, when we can't sense it, that he's up to something because we believe and we trust in his character. We need to up our faith for this season. You need to up your faith for your family and your children and your marriage and this church and view weekend. You need to up your faith. What is God's vision for it? Catch that vision. What is God's vision for your life? Ask him to help you catch that vision. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Pursuing Jesus requires humility. And for some of us this morning, this is where it begins. This is where it needs to start. When we humble ourselves and we get low and we acknowledge our need and we seek his face and we turn away from the things that are hurting us and hurting intimacy with Jesus, the things that are no longer working, and we do that work, he will hear us and forgive us and he will heal us. That's his promise. And I can think of no better use of our time and no greater need in our lives than his healing. And when we seek his presence, notice Jesus' interaction with this woman. There's no shame. There's no rejection. There's no qualification. There's no exception. There is just grace. There is just mercy. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can approach him with confidence, and we can receive healing in his presence. So his presence heals us, and his presence covers us. One of the most beautiful and impactful things his presence does for us is cover us. In Genesis 3, we read about how Adam and Eve, they sin, and they eat of the tree that God asked them not to eat from. He knew that there were things they shouldn't know, things they could not understand, things that were meant to be outside of their reach and in his hand. And still, through the lie of the enemy, they began to doubt the character of God and their relationship to him, and they crossed that boundary in the aid of the tree, and everything, as we know, changed. And in Genesis 3, it says this. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. The shame of their disobedience caused Adam and Eve to hide when God wanted to be their covering. And the difference between covering and hiding is that shame. It's rooted in it. It breaks closeness, but covering is rooted in trust, and it brings closeness. And this sin, it introduced fear and doubt and insecurity into our relationship with God, and it begins to pollute our perspective of him and our perspective of ourselves. And this is what the enemy wanted because he knew that a people empowered with the right belief in God and the right belief in themselves would be unstoppable. And so this is still his pursuit, that we would continue to doubt the goodness of God and also the impact we can have on the earth empowered by him and in relationship with him. Adam and Eve knew God in a way that we can't even fully comprehend. I mean, can you imagine? They walked in the garden with him. They were his fir- the first people he created. They had ownership. They had authority. Adam got to name the animals. This isn't lore, this happened, okay? And they walked with him. They knew him intimately. They got to see him and be in close friendship and relationship with just complete freedom and purity. They knew him, but it's their sin that caused them to diminish what they knew and believe a lie. And so they clothed themselves And they hid, and they retreated, and relationship was altered. We read in Romans 13, 14, it says, Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. This was always God's aim and design, that we would clothe ourselves not with shame, 
and our own means of hiding, but that we would be covered by him and clothe ourselves in him. When we hide, we miss out on the covering and the protection the presence of God can give us. And in shame, Adam and Eve realized their nakedness and their vulnerability and their humanity, and they saw these things as bad instead of seeing these things from God's point of view, and they clothed themselves. But we are called to clothe ourselves with the presence of Christ. My eldest daughter, River, she is super affectionate. Like if we're talking love languages, physical touch, along with words of affirmation and quality time and acts of service, all tied for one, (laughs) first place. Those are her love languages. Anybody else? Like you take the test and you're like, but all of them. She's very affectionate. And this girl, she wants a hug and a kiss on the lips when I leave the room let alone leave the house. This is the requirement. And I've I've told her countless times, River, I am not going to leave the house without saying goodbye to you. I'm going to give you a hug and a kiss. Don't worry. It's very important that she receives that reassurance. Never have I once done that, by the way. I don't know where it's all rooted. But she needs that reassurance. And we've noticed as she's gotten older that in moments of discipline, what repairs and what brings comfort to her pain, and what makes her feel reconnected to mom and dad is this. When there is that divide and that distance, what I say only helps so much. She needs to feel my covering. She needs to feel my comfort. She needs my presence. She needs my tangible touch to make her feel safe and loved and regulated and it brings all the chaos and all the pain into peace when she receives that we are her covering and this is a picture of what the father wants to give you he wants to cover you in moments of sin and in moments where you want to withdraw from shame in moments when you feel unworthy in moments even where there's consequence and outcome and things that are part of us learning and growing and maturing even still he wants to cover you he wants to comfort you i love also in psalm 31 19 through 20 We read a little bit more about what his covering gives us. It says, how abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all on those who take refuge in you. In the shelter of your presence, you hide them from all human intrigues. You keep them safe in your dwelling from accusing tongues. God's presence is a shelter from the plans and the lies of man. Isn't that crazy? When the accusations of others, when the jealousies of others, when things have been spoken over you, lies, gossip, his presence shields you. It's the safe place you can run to hide. When, pl- when people plot, when they plan, when somebody's showing an unhealthy interest in your life, when they're not respecting your boundaries, when there's something that feels spiritually amiss in a relationship, that God's presence covers you, It says, in the shelter of your presence, you hide them, you keep them safe. Some of us are dealing with toxic relationships. We feel we are living under the lie and curse and accusations of others. No, you are not. Because when you allow the presence of God to cover you, you are hidden from those things, which means that they cannot see you, and you are kept safe. Isn't this amazing? This is the power of the presence of Jesus in our lives. This is the power of his covering that in relationship to other people and even in relationship to ourself, that he causes all of it to come to peace under his covering, that he is our safest place. He is the place we can tuck into to hide in when life is stressful and overwhelming when we feel misunderstood in relationships, when you feel like that person just keeps getting the promotion and it keep, you just feel overlooked, you don't know what God is up to. You felt a calling, but you don't know where he is in your story. People prophesied things over you and then you feel like maybe you messed it all up. People diminish what you do with your life. They don't understand. The way you parent gets misunderstood. You don't feel supported by your family. We all experience these things, right? Relationships can hurt. Those words, they impact us. 
And the presence of God wants to be your covering this morning and shield you from that pain and hide you away from the attacks and the lies and the tongues of man. This is what he can do as your father. It's incredible. His presence covers us. His presence refreshes us. Acts 3, 19 through 20 tells us this. says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. A time of refreshing from the Lord is on the other side of our repentance. And this is why it's so important for us to understand the nature of God, his goodness, his disposition towards us, because repentance is not a bad word. It's nothing to be afraid of when we understand him, that he is the covering, that he is the safety, that he is our belonging. So when we understand that, then repentance is simply just getting right back on the path that he has for us. He longs to cover you, not expose you, And this passage tells us that the refreshing you long for could be on the other side of your repentance, on getting pure again in heart and in mind. Because when we repent, we get relief and freedom and refreshing. Those things follow obedience. We talked about refreshing a little bit at our sisterhood event a couple weeks ago, that the refreshing we truly need, the refreshing we're made for, that soul deep kind, it can only be found in his presence. Self-help, self-care, powering through, those things, they can only take us so far. But we hit a wall, don't we? We hit a wall, emotionally, mentally, physically. Maybe you're one of those strong types. You're always fine. Fine doesn't mean anything, right? Maybe this is how you've like been taught to operate. This is your understanding of strength. This is your understanding of leadership. This is your understanding of coping. This is, your, this is how we live. I'm fine, whatever. But if we're honest, refreshing, man, that sounds nice. Maybe almost sounds like a luxury, like a spa day that you don't have time for. Spiritually, God has a refreshing for you that is soul deep that meets those needs you can't even put words to. When asked how you are, maybe you don't even know how to properly relay your experience. Guess what? God intimately knows you. You don't really even have to discuss it with him. You can just simply repent, turn, obey, receive his refreshing, and there's no shame and there's no disconnect, and immediately it's like you're forged together again, and you're refreshed in ways that you could never conjure up. Brother Lawrence says in the practice of the presence of God, he keeps it so simple, and he says this about the presence of God. He says, the presence of God is the life and nourishment of the soul. And we must become people of the presence of God and not limit our pursuit to it, to a Sunday morning or even a weekend experience, because his presence is not like the dessert we sometimes afford ourselves. It is basic nourishment. And we were never created or meant to live without his presence in our day-to-day lives. And I believe that when we become people who seek his presence, and when we set aside a weekend like the weekend, we don't have to will for something to happen. We won't be able to stop it from happening in us or in our community because God's just going to respond. He responds to our worship. He responds to a heart towards him. This is what he can do. His presence, it refreshes you from struggle. It refreshes you from insecurity. It refreshes you from loneliness. It refreshes you from the burdens of life, the stress you feel, the pressure you feel under all the time, that lie that you never do enough, that you'll never be enough. How many need relief from that lie, from that feeling that does not have to be our reality? In his presence, it changes. He brings all of that to a halt, and he refreshes us in a transformative way where we are never the same. Life is the same. The struggles may not lift. The circumstances may not change. 
but you are different. And this is what I said in the beginning, that there's a difference between the people that know about God and the people that have been with him. This is what marks us in the world. You might have the same hard job as the guy next to you, but you can be different. Your kids, man, they are still hard. And that has not changed, but you've been refreshed. And so you are different, and you show up differently because you made time. You got into his presence, and you received from him. John tells us in John 15 that without him, our lives will produce nothing that lasts. And whatever we put our hands to without his presence will wither and fade. And this is a reality check for some of us today because what a shame it would be to spend our lives working so hard but be apart from the presence of God only to realize that everything in our lives couldn't last and couldn't be good without him. Don't work without his refreshing. Don't lead without his refreshing. Don't parent without his refreshing. Don't work on your friendships or your marriage without his refreshing. Do not be a person of God in this world without his refreshing. And only with his presence that refreshes us do our lives bear fruit that's good, fruit that lasts, fruit that can nourish others and make a difference. This is our calling. His presence refreshes us. And then my last point for us this morning is his presence empowers us. It empowers us. Exodus 33, we find Moses. Moses had a journey, right? Like, if you ever wonder, God, me, read about Moses. <laughs> he asked that question a couple times. In Moses 33, I mean, in Exodus 33, verse 12, it says, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people. This is how I read it. You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Doesn't this sound like what it is to follow Jesus with our lives? God, you said this, but like how? And when? And in what manner? Right? We've all asked these questions, and sometimes we want answers. But pay attention to what Moses says in verse 13, because this is our example today. The posture we take when we don't know the answers. And when he's called us to something, or even the life that we were just talking about, of living differently, and we just don't know how. His prayer is, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Moses understands that knowing God is the answer. That as we come to know him in a deeper way, we come to know ourselves and then the way forward. His desire was to know him. He sought his presence and then look at God's reply. My presence will go with you. The answer to all of his questions was, my presence will be with you. My presence will be with you. And Moses, he understands the power, the value, the strength of the presence of God because he says, oh, no, I can't do this without that. I don't want to go anywhere. I can't move an inch without the presence of God with me. It is the presence of God that empowers us to follow him with courage, to do things we otherwise couldn't or wouldn't do. And without his presence, it doesn't really matter what else we've brought with us. And so know today, if you feel a little unqualified, if you're feeling at your limit, know that if you have the presence of God in your circumstance, you have everything you need. You have everything you need to face the impossible. Zechariah 4, 6 says to us, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Jesus told his disciples it was good that he go so that we receive the Holy Spirit and experience the empowerment we receive in his presence. And he told his disciples, not as a joke, that they would do greater things than he would. How did he think that would happen? He knew it would be the presence of God, the mark of the Holy Spirit on the people of God, that that is how we would operate a new authority and see things happen that Jesus himself did not happen, see happen that this can be our reality. We rarely see it, but it's the destiny of those who live in his presence. 
that we would see him do things on the earth through us that Jesus didn't even do. And when we rely on our abilities and our confidence and the perfect set of circumstances, we'll never step into all that he has for us. If we do not require his presence to go with us, then we're not going where he wants us to go. If we are not going with his presence, then we are not operating in our full capacity and in our calling because he does not call you to do things you can do without it. I love what Godwin and Robert says in The Grace Outpouring. If you need a book to read to raise your faith, The Grace Outpouring is one of the best books I read last year. It says, if everything in our lives flow from his presence, then we will see the words, works, and wonders come from the overflow of his work in us. Instead of trying to make things happen, we won't be able to stop them. Think about Peter and Pentecost in Acts 2. Peter was a doofus. He was a doofus. You haven't heard that one in a while, huh? I haven't said it in a while either. I wasn't expecting to do that. Peter was a doofus. He just never really got it right. But he was, Jesus loved him. He was a friend of Jesus. And when they are awaiting the Holy Spirit to come, just as Jesus prophesied would happen, and then it happens, Peter gets up and he preaches a word. And we read that thousands came into the family of God as a result of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on a doofus. This is what can happen. His presence empowers us to fulfill his will. And some of us, we don't pursue the presence of God because we're afraid of what he'll ask us to do. We don't want to be used. We're a little scared. I get that. But don't miss it. You've got one life. You've got one life. And you've got people in your world who need to see you living in your purpose and living empowered. It will make all the difference for them. Invite the presence of God into your life and into your story. See what he'll do through you. Not everybody has the same destiny as Peter, but everybody empowered by the presence of God will see an outpouring of his love and grace on what you say yes to. That is for sure. Let me remind you of what Peter says in Acts 2, 17 to 21. This is what happens when we receive his presence. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Acts 2, 17 through 21. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone, say everyone, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the picture of what happens when we are empowered by his presence. So my husband, Reed, he's really into cars. Anybody else? Do we need to start a support group? He's really into cars. He talks about cars all the time. And he, he asks me to notice cars on the road and asks me what I think. And um, I will say that over our 13 years together, I've gotten better, okay? I can tell a good sound from a bad sound. I know if a car is tricked out in a way that's cool or if it's just ugly. Like, I know things now, okay? And um, I know, too, I've been reassured many times that just because he's looking at a car doesn't mean we're going to buy it. That was always the question, or the response, rather. No question, but just like, no, we can't. What are you talking about? I'm not saying we're going to. What, do you think it's cool? Yes, I think it's cool. Okay. So, cars, yeah, it's a... It plays a role in our life. He loves cars. I love that for him and everything that makes his heart shine. But something I blame him for is that once he's brought a car, a certain car to my attention, I notice it everywhere. Have you ever been there where you're thinking about buying a car or you've been looking into one or you just bought one and now you just feel really cool because they're everywhere. Or maybe that makes you feel less cool. I don't know. I'm obviously still learning. Um, but you notice it everywhere. And your interest in that car and or your recent purchase of that car didn't magically put more of those cars on the road, right? You just see them now. You're just more aware of them. They catch your attention. 
And we've been talking about the presence of God this morning, and the scriptures have compelled us with what happens when we pursue the presence of God. But maybe you're asking, now what? How? You look for it. You become aware of it. You open your eyes to it. You invite God to show it to you everywhere. That your eyes would be open to his presence. And like Moses, we would ask that his presence goes with us wherever he takes us and to wherever he calls us. We do not have to work harder for his presence to come. We just have to open our eyes. And it really is this shift in perspective that when we wake up, throughout our day, as our day closes. Lord, fill me with your presence. You could even use these points as you begin to pray for an awareness of his presence. Lord, would your presence heal me? Lord, would your presence cover me? Lord, would your presence refresh me? Lord, would your presence empower me today? Right now, we can pray these things and our awareness of him can increase. We're encouraged by Psalm 139, seven through 15. He says, David, he knows this. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me. We know that feeling. And the light become like night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Where can you flee from his presence? You can't. You can't. It is here, friends. It is living within you if you've confessed Jesus as Lord. His presence is ready to empower you. It is ready to encourage you and heal you, refresh you, cover you, do all the things he longs to see happen. Would we pursue it and not wait for next Friday, but do it now? Would we pursue his presence now and tomorrow when you wake up and you go about your ordinary existence, inviting his presence to come and make it extraordinary because he can and he wants to.